So I'm going to share with you a little bit of the story of my maternal grandparents. I think some of you know a little bit of this as we've talked more personally. They were Central and Eastern European Jews, respectively. My grandfather was born in Brody, which at the time was Poland and is now part of the territory of the Ukraine. My grandmother was born in Vienna to a, a somewhat more established and elite family. And they met in Vienna. My grandfather was a young prodigy on the piano, and he had been identified already by the age of 12 as being a very promising young artist, and so he'd been sent to Vienna to study. Well, then came the events of the mid-1930s. And in 1938, there was the Anschluss, and Austria became part of the Nazi Empire, the growing Third Reich, and things began to get very ugly there. Uh, my grandfather, in the fall of 1938, was arrested on the street by the SS. He was dragged to the basement of a house that had been used for the purpose of torturing and uh, interrogating people, and there he was beaten until he was unconscious. Um, they knew that he was a pianist. They deliberately uh, walked on his fingers to break them in the hope that he would never be able to play again. Well, he somehow managed to make his way out of that, find his way back to Vienna. Um, he went to the hospital with, at that time, still his fiancée, and he, uh, it was a Catholic hospital, and the nurses basically said, Mr. Mahler fell down the stairs, didn't he? And she was about to object, and they said more pointedly, Mr. Mahler fell down the stairs, didn't he? And she got the point that this was what they had to put on the official diagnosis if they were going to be able to treat him without getting into trouble. He was then told, well, you have two options. We can splint your fingers, but you will never play again. Or we can leave them free and your fiance can massage them back to health, which is going to be a much more difficult and agonizing way to heal, but you will be able to play again. And he chose the latter. Well, they knew they had to get out at that point, and so they made plans to leave Europe. Uh, they went on successive days. My grandfather crossed the border from Austria to Hungary the day before Hitler closed the borders. My grandmother the day after. She ran into a border guard who had a look at the big red J on her passport, closed it up, handed it back to her, and turned the other way. She didn't need to ask twice what that meant. She walked right past and was one of the last ones to get out. Well, my grandmother's family, all because of having a certain amount of wealth and means, was able to get out, and they were dispersed eventually throughout North America and Australia. My grandfather's family was not so fortunate. They were stuck in Poland, and none of them survived the war. He received news of this in the 1950s. Now, of course, all of this happened before my time. I only knew them in their much older years, um, in the 70s and 80s. And I experienced something from them. These stories only came to me later, mostly through my parents, or through kind of reading through family archives. I experienced them in a very different way. I experienced a couple of people who actually were quite rigid in the world. It was rather odd. Um, they would turn on the TV and speak tremendously judgmentally about just about everything they were seeing in the news. Everybody was making the wrong decisions. Um, they had rather unenlightened attitudes, I have to say, toward issues of race and class, and I heard about this quite a bit. Um, and if things were not exactly to their liking, there was quite a lot of complaining. Now the reason I tell you this story is because it's complex. It's difficult to encapsulate. It's multifaceted. The lines between the oppressor and the oppressed are blurred. This past week, one of our members came to me and took me very gently to task on some of the preaching and the messages 
testing that I've been doing for the last couple of weeks. When we get to this point in the liturgical year, we begin to hear about fairly apocalyptic messages, like last week we heard about the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. And what this member noted to me was that in talking about this, I've always kind of been putting us in the place of the people for whom things are being destroyed, and how this gives us an opportunity to witness. Now this, of course, is a worthy thing for us to ponder as Christians. But what he noted to me is sometimes that's not the place we're in. If we look in the mirror and we're really honest with ourselves, we're not always the victims. We're not always the ones for whom things are being destroyed. Sometimes we're the ones doing the destroying. And that's something that we need to wrestle with as well. And that's where my grandparents' story came to me, because obviously, for a large, significant chunk of their young lives, they were absolutely the ones being destroyed. And yet the people that I knew in their older years, even though I hate to say this, were sometimes on the side of the destroyers. It's complicated. We're complicated people with complicated stories. I'm sure if I asked any one of you to come up here and share with any degree of fullness your own story, it too would be complex. You never occupy just a single role. So now enter today's gospel story. It is beautifully, horrifyingly perhaps, but still beautifully, complex in the same way. There are several great human archetypes that we can see in it. One of the most obvious ones is what I would call shadow king, the forces of empire. The leaders and the people who walk by thinking they're the ones in control and deriding Jesus, knowing he's the one up on the cross, we're not. And then, then there are the bandits. I actually have a great deal of sympathy with the bandits in Roman times. It's not that they made great decisions, but they were placed in a context where sometimes it must have seemed the decisions they were making were the only things available to them. But even within the bandits, we have two archetypes. We have the faithless bandit who, in spite of the fact that he is hanging up on the cross right next to Jesus, is still parroting the same rhetoric that we're getting from down on the floor. Aren't you the Messiah? Well, if you are, prove it, buddy. Save yourself and us. Even in that position, he is deriding Jesus in the same way as the shadow king. But then we have the faithful bandit, the one who realizes the position he's really in with respect to both the shadow king and Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And finally, Finally, we have the true king, not the shadow. And the true king is not sitting on any kind of throne we would recognize. He is on a throne that is a cross. That will keep you up at night. And from his throne that is a cross, he's giving edicts and dispensing gifts. Still in that moment, He's dispensing gifts of grace and saying, today, you will be with me in paradise. I'm the real king. I'm the one who has the real power. And finally, we have the crowd. The crowd that gets so little attention because it does so little and says so little. It just looks on. And yet, isn't looking on and saying nothing and doing nothing actually an incredibly intentional act. And so we have all of these archetypes, and this story asks us the very difficult, the very bold question of where are we in it? Which archetype are we occupying? Are we the leaders, the shepherds?
shadow kings? Are we the crowd that looks on and says nothing and does nothing, perhaps out of fear, perhaps with good reason? Are we the faithless bandit, the one being condemned for our actions, who still spouts the language of the shadow king? Or are we the faithful bandit? Are we the one who recognizes and even at the last minute turns around and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom? Or are we perhaps the most blessed of all, the ones who are walking the path of the true king? Our lives are complex. There's almost never a single answer to that question. But I would note to you that these archetypes end up in a very different place at the end of all things. There's no question, the scripture says unequivocally, that the true king and the faithful bandit both wind up in paradise. With the others, we're not quite so sure. In fact, the implication is quite a bit more repentance needs to happen before that conversation can occur. And with the crowd, we just don't know. It's left open-ended. There's obviously still much opportunity, but there's much mystery. So today I would ask you, where does your life, your little S story, fit into this capital S story? And just remember that at some point, there's a choice to be made. Are we going to be the shadow kings? 